for full-length audio. You can listen to us wherever you get your podcast. And on YouTube, please consider liking and subscribing for new content every week. And now, on to the video. So, pretty much every one of our shows, we, we have a personal touch to it. Whether we've been there or whether we, we enjoy the subject matter, you know, we try to inject as much of our own personal, personal thoughts and we try to really connect with, with all our shows. Today's is not going to be any different. In fact, <clears throat> it's really personal to me. Um, as I mentioned in the open, I was raised in between Tucson, Arizona and San Diego, respectively. Um, but my formative years, I would say, were probably in San Diego. Um, and I have some listeners back home. Thanks. Welcome, San Diego. And um, so, yeah, this this has a little bit of a personal touch. Um, and it's it's definitely one of those with April coming. Um, and, and I'll explain that with April coming. It, 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 it gives me gives me joy and also a little bit of melancholy. Um, so when I lived out there, uh, I lived with my dad and uh, my grandmother. And we, you know, we, we had a great time, moved out there when I was young. Um, went all the way through high school and a little bit of uh, adulthood and college in San Diego. Um, and I lost dad back in 2001 and I lost him April 4th. So it's pretty close to that time. And it's, I guess it's just, uh, it's given that, that this topic we're doing today, uh, so close to July or to, I'm sorry, to April 4th. So, um, yeah, you know, I've got a lot of great memories of San Diego. We used to go from, uh, well, initially we had lived in the North Park area. And if you're from San Diego, you, that's a very, very well-known area. It's close to Balboa Park. Um, and if you've been to San Diego, obviously Balboa Park's a, a, a very well-known place. Um, so we kind of went through, uh, I think about a year or so of going from North Park to Old Town. And in Old Town, there is a church, I believe, Immaculate Heart, if I remember right. Gosh, don't kill me, guys, if I'm wrong. But that church um, is right smack in Old Town, San Diego. And uh, so that was a really quick drive. But, you know, we kind of got to know the clergy and got to know the people and the other parishioners. And we weren't really, really super religious, but we did have faith. And, um, you know, so we really connected with that with that group of people. So... And we moved to the Del Cerro area. And if you're not from San Diego, that is a that's a pretty good long clip to go from the Del Cerro area over to Old Town. So eventually we ended up going to uh, St. Therese, which is there off of Navajo Road. So, um, so then we left there. But I have some great memories. And one of the memories of, of this church was what was just right, pretty much adjacent to it. And that is the Whaley House. Now, we didn't typically go to the Whaley House right after church, but it was always there. And it was always kind of one of those things, uh, somewhat somewhat ominous and, and just kind of hanging out there. So, you know, without thinking too much of it, you know, it, it just was a, another piece of property on this really cool street in Old Town. And as I got older, I started to kind of get an idea of what the Whaley House is and what it meant to San Diego and, and all the uh, reported paranormal activity. Um, and if I remember right, there was some ha Halloween stuff that would happen. Um, I don't know if they do that much anymore, but I think they used to do uh, tours uh, during the evening, during Halloween. You know, just kind of scare you up a little bit, get you ready for the holiday. But um, but yeah, it was, it is, I should say, reported as the most haunted house in America. Uh, you know, sure, I, I, I will I will concede that to a point. But, um, yeah, I don't know if I'm 100% on board on that, but it is certainly haunted. Uh, done, done the tour several times, um, gone there with some friends. Uh, in fact, one of my last memories of being around that area is we went to Hungry's, which is just right across the street. And that's where you could get that yard beer of, of, of shame. Cause if you got that yard beer, you weren't, you weren't walking out quite the same from, from hungry. So anyway, um, but yeah, let's, let's kind of dive into some of the history of the Whaley house. The Whaley house is a historic house slash museum located in San Diego, California. It was built in 1857 by Thomas Whaley, not just a clever name. who was a prominent businessman in that area. He and his family moved into the home on August 22nd of 1857. 
The family consisted of Thomas, of course, who was married to Anna, and they had six children, Francis Thomas Whaley Jr., Anna Amelia, George Hay Ringold, Violet Eloise, and Corinne Lillian. And as you would probably think, being a prominent businessman, uh, things would probably go pretty well for someone. They had they had a home, and then I believe they had a store as well. So, you know, they probably figured, hey, we're doing pretty good. And unfortunately, that's not what really happened. It would seem that, um, well, tragedy struck. Thomas Whaley Jr. suffered from scarlet fever at 18 months and died on January 29th of 1858. You know, you would think after the death of his baby, things couldn't get much worse for him. Well, actually, it got a lot worse. Uh, Somebody decided, well, let's just go ahead and burn his store to the ground. That sounds like a great idea. So, if it wasn't devastating enough to have the loss of their of their child, now they've lost their their ability to make well to to have income. So they did what what I would imagine would seem like making some sense in that day. They packed everybody up and moved out to San Francisco. Um, and I don't believe that went any better. I think tragedy followed them as well. But um, they turned all over operations in Old Town to Frank Ames, and he did that in January of 1859. So he goes up to San Francisco, uh, I would imagine has a a fairly decent life. There was probably some lucrative dealings because he did make some money and he invested some new capital and did some things and decided, well, how about we decide to move right back to San Diego? You know, because if we're doing better here, why couldn't we turn things around back then or back there? So Frank heads out there ahead of his family, uh, does some probably some revisions to the house they haven't been there and make sure it's nice and comfortable for the family and they fixed it up and then he sent for Anna and the rest of the family and I think they got there somewhere around December 12th of 1868 and this is where the story kind of gets a little sideways from everyone so January 5th of 1882 uh, Violet Eloise and Anna Amelia were both married in Old Town and um, I think the the worst that happened was Violet was married to a gentleman who probably did not have the greatest past and he proved to be a pretty worthless uh, suitor and the Whaley, the mother and the father decided they wanted to sever all contact from him and Violet became very, very upset about that. Uh, She suffered from an immense amount of melancholy over that and unfortunately Violet committed suicide by shooting herself in the chest with Thomas's 32 caliber on August 19th of 1885. Uh, She was 22 years of age and her suicide note read, Mad from life's history, swift to the death's mystery, glad to be hurled anywhere, anywhere out of this world. That's pretty sad. So already we're starting to see things sort of slip away from the Whaley family. Troubled by everything that happened, uh, Thomas decided, well, things sure don't seem to be getting any better. Um... Let's let's get a change of scenery. So they built a single story home uh, somewhere downtown San Diego area and they moved to the new residence, leaving the Whaley house vacant for over two decades. Um, Yeah. So unfortunately, Thomas Whaley never lived in that home again. Uh, He died due to ill health at that State Street address and uh, Anna Amelia Whaley died at Modesto, California in December 12th of 1905. So there was the Whaley House, completely vacant, and it fell into to what I imagine would be horrible disrepair. Um, but, however, in late 1909, uh, Francis Whaley undertook a restoration project, and he built a house and turned it into a tourist attraction. And he posted signs promoting its historic uh, significance and entertained visitors and played guitar. Um, so it really kind of became more of a beacon of entertainment at that point. They had a small theater, and I believe it to have been San Diego's first theater. Um, And they they basically, all the family moved back in, and they lived out the rest of their days um, until Corinne died in 1953. And that was the last Whaley to live in the home. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they left. Before we get too far into it, the area that the Whaley House was built uh, there used to be, uh, well, I should say there there was an incident in which a, what they believed to be a boat robber 
was uh, executed on the grounds of the where the home now stands. So it was not always a very clean and comfortable area. It already was troubled before they even erected this house. So what does all that time do to a home with all that tragedy? Well, that's going to be in our next part. The Whaley House has gained the reputation of being the most haunted house in America. And I covered that in the beginning of the, uh, of the show. Now, there has been no shortage of reports of strange noises and creaks and thumpings in the night. But I think you got to kind of figure that a house of this age is going to have some kind of thumping and some kind of creaking. I mean, it's it's a friggin' old house. Lots of wood. Things move. Not to mention, it's in San Diego, California. And then we had these things called earthquakes. And I'm sure it was not up to earthquake standards. So it could be shifting quite a bit. And much like most the... Most of the things we cover on the show, this particular location has been been visited by, I think, pretty much every paranormal television show or podcast, uh, BuzzFeed. I mean, they've all been there, um, not only because you get a free trip to San Diego out of it, but it is very well documented that there has been a lot of tragedy in this home and of course with tragedy comes the very real possibility of paranormal activity if you believe in that sort of thing um you know he, we see this time and time again there's a lot of homes properties buildings that that see a, a great amount of tragedy much like the uh, missouri state penitentiary episode in which we covered that i mean i think that whether it's a residual haunting and whether it's a a I guess I should say whether it's an intelligent haunting or one that can at least interact with you, um, you know, that really just depends. But I think that having that kind of tragedy could lead to any type of paranormal activity. So let's talk a little bit about what their what the reports are and what what's being seen out there. I mentioned a little bit about Yankee Jim, and I uh, didn't really clarify much because I knew I would go a little bit more into depth here. Um, on the property of the Whaley House, where it currently sits, used to be gallows, and the gallows were used from uh, from a very long time, and I would imagine, I mean, who only knows how many people were put to death there, which could or could not have something to do with the amount and level of activity there, but... Anyway, in 1852, a man known as Yankee Jim Robinson, uh, he was caught trying to steal a boat, and he was beaten and taken to jail. Now, the the court practices and uh, delivering of, well, let's just say things moved a lot quicker back then. <laughs> um, nowadays, you know, you've got a much longer process, and um, yeah, so he was sentenced and beaten and taken to jail. Now, in his trial... He was sentenced to hang for his crime. And that's where things get a really, really bad for, for Yankee Jim. Uh, September 18th of 1852, that was the day of his execution. Um, so he was was still badly beaten and barely conscious. So he, did nev- he never received any medical care. Um, and the sheriff decided, well, that's fine by me. We're going to take him out anyway. So... They ordered his death, and during the execution, let's just say it was more than just botched. Um, the executioners did not factor Jim's height, and when they constructed the gallows, it was too short, and Jim's toes scraped on the ground and took about 45 minutes to pass. So basically, they strangled this man to death. To me, that, that definitely does not fit the crime. Um, who knows? Maybe there's more involved in that, but that's basically the story that we have. Um, but obviously, that that had some kind of effect on Yankee Jim's spirit, and it is said that uh, you know he's hanging around the house, and people have heard him trudging around the uh, the area and basically in the house with uh, like a heavy boot sound upstairs. And the gala where the <laughs> where it once stood, there's now an archway between the music room and the parlor room, and visitors have felt like they were being strangled while passing through that archway. And in 1869, uh, the city leased the first floor as a courtroom. 
and apparently there's a, a heavy chain there uh, that people see swinging by itself, and and several pe- several people have felt uneasy there, myself included. When I went there to visit, yeah, you definitely feel like a heavy presence there, um, it's, and it's really small, so it's not like this is a huge space. So, yeah, it, it is very interesting uh, that particular room, which we'll get back to. Somewhat of an intriguing report. Um, as I mentioned, in 1869, they leased the first floor as a courthouse. Well, I guess in 1871, uh, an angry mob held Anna Whaley at gunpoint on the ninth step of the stairs. And what they what they state is public records were being removed. I wonder if that has to do with the fact that they were moving the courthouse from that area or from that room. But I find it a bit interesting that it... <laughs> That she had to be held at gunpoint. Um, it makes me wonder if there was some kind of, uh, I guess, resentment or resistance that they didn't want it moved. Was there, you know, was there something going on? I, I find that intriguing because you only get a little blurb of that. And I've done a good amount of research on it and haven't really found a reason for it. But um, at any rate, uh, what they state is that while you were in the uh, in the house and on the stairs, Sometimes they get like a chill in the air, and um, they. This is the part that I, I guess I don't understand that much is that the ghost of Thomas Whaley has been seen on the second floor landing, um, and I guess he's dressed in a black coat and a white brimmed hat. The thing that I guess with Thomas Whaley, you know, he did not die in the home. Um, does that mean that when you pass, you can choose where you go? Sure, I, I could, I could see that. I guess if you're gonna, if you're gonna buy into the the entirety of the paranormal and ghosts, then you'd have to pretty much buy in that you could move about. But you know, with so much negativity and things that had happened in that home for for Thomas, why would he go back? I don't know. I find that part interesting, but the fact that that Anna was held at gunpoint is is very interesting. Um, you know, as we mentioned, the first floor uh, was utilized as an entertainment area, especially towards the end. Um, and in, there was a music room. And in the music room, there are reports of turn of the century songs, um, which which would obviously be fitting. Um, you know, music has something with with paranormal uh, in the sense that. <sighs> You feel a lot of joy, sadness. You, you run through the whole range of emotions with music. So I could see where if there was an area with music or with arts, there would be some kind of connection to it because it may be a focal point to a good time or a, or a particular time that was important to you in your life. So in addition to the music, uh, there there's laughter heard and the smell of cigar smoke and, and perfume, which apparently dissipates rather quickly, which would make sense. And there's a lamp in the music room that has a couple of crystals that hang from it. And apparently every once in a while they've been they've been seen moving while other ones are motionless. I mean, you can attribute some of that to, you know, air, breeze, things like that. But, you know, it is interesting of note anyway. It has also been reported that the electric lights in the house, uh, they tend to flicker at times. Um, they go on and off by themselves. Now, they state there have been inspections and found nothing to explain it. But, you know, this is this obviously was a much older home. I would imagine electricity was something that was added after its build. Um, and it could be just old wiring. Um, you know, you have electricians that say everything is fine. I get that. Um, but I just, I don't know. When it comes to things like electricity... It's not that I think that couldn't be paranormal. Absolutely could be. I just, I, I don't, I guess I don't completely buy into it because anybody who's ever, you know, been in a storm or seen, you know, electricity go in and out. I mean, there's so many different things that that can be explained to, you know, I, I, I guess that's not one of the things I lend to. But again, everybody's got their own opinion on it. Uh, and in the mid 1800s, a young girl was running down the hillside by the house and as awful as it sounds, she was struck. She struck a clothesline which crushed her throat. Um, well, you know, needless to say, she was brought in the kitchen, and she later died on the kitchen table. Now, since then, a blonde girl has been seen in the kitchen, running in the yard, or running in the yard, I should say. And they state that pots and pans that are hanging in the kitchen are also seen to, to move. Um, and there's. <laughs> 
<laughs> we're going to talk about the backyard here shortly because that's where I had my own personal experience. But there's a lot of quote unquote heebie jeebies in that house when it pertains to the to the outside for sure. Um, and then sometimes at night, a figure can be seen in the upstairs window um, or upstairs windows because there's more than just one uh, long after everyone has left the building. So, you know, a lot of that passerby, hey, I see somebody in the window. It's tough to it's tough to trouble or troubleshoot. It's tough to um, to dispute because, you know, they don't know for sure anybody's been gone. Now, they may say it's been at certain times, but, you know, you don't know. You, you just don't know in that sense. Um, but again, these are these are reported experiences and they're worth no. Um, the ground floor windows have been sealed shut to keep them from being opened at night, um, setting off the alarm. But they do sometimes get open and they do set the alarm off. Um, so that that's interesting, considering they were sealed. Um, you know, that being said, you know, could it have not been sealed correctly? Um, you know, Things like that, I, I tend to lean on the on the plausibility that there's something with the home. It's settling, um, you know, it's old. So if things creak and move, it could break seals and, you know, those sort of things. I tend to lean towards the the non paranormal. But again, it, it has been noted and it is definitely worth talking about. Now, poor little Thomas Whaley, you know, he uh he didn't really have much luck in this life. He, uh, you know, he was the first to die in the home and he died at only 17 months and it was in his upstairs bedroom. Um, so yeah, needless to say that that tends to be a room with a lot of activity and, and people report the sound of crying babies and, and just, a a sense of, of that feeling of somebody watching you. And in addition to that, the ghost of a small dog has been seen coming and going from that room. And that just seems to be interesting. Now that dog is also seen outside in the yard. Um, and curtains, curtains often move in the home. Um, you know, again, you can sometimes attribute that to, to wind. And in that area, incidentally, it, it can get pretty windy, especially coming off the, uh, the harbor. So again, that's one of those things you probably could attribute a little bit to natural causes. Um, but it, it, in, when you look at the entirety of the situation, paranormal activity, you can't just arbitrarily discount it either. And along with the curtains, it's said that uh, many of the rocking chairs, especially one in the upstairs bedroom, has been known to rock on its own. I mean, again, could it be environmental? Uh, could there have been strong winds at the time? I'm sure if people that reported these things would have also reported if there was wind. But again, it's tough to, to refute and it's tough to debunk something that could be so objective. Um, and, and again, paranormal in it, in it's, in its complete existence. And it's, I guess, and you have to understand that there's some objectivity behind it. Right. Um, and that's why a lot of people either completely go off the rails and not believe in it. And then, of course, there are people that that definitely deeply believe in it. But sometimes you have to concede that there is a lot of objectivity. And as long as you keep that in mind, you know, some of these things that could be environmental, you can you can easily say to yourself, well, I mean, could it be paranormal? Sure, it's possible. But I tend to lean more on the firsthand experiences of you know, um, disembodied voices, full body apparitions, things like that, EVPs, things of that nature. Whereas things that can be really, really easily described as environmental, it's tougher for me to lean on that. Um, case in point, and there are several mirrors in the home, and at some time, uh, people report seeing faces in it. Now, a lot of people will say, well, you know, the human mind, when they see things that can't really explain, they do what they call matrixing. So by nature, humans want to categorize things. That's just what we do. It's how our brain, you know, sort of sort of understands the world and, and, and adapts to what's around it as it tries to, to categorize different things. And if there's an anomaly like that, does our brain say, okay, we need to make sense of this somehow. It looks like a face and now it's a face. You know, it could be. Sure. Absolutely. Or could it be just be a face of a ghost? I mean... 
that's where your sense of objectivity comes in and what you what you believe and what you don't believe. But to me, that could also be a little bit of matrixing with your eyes and trying to make sense of what you see. So the backyard. This is where I had a little bit of a more personal experience. Um, you know, there was a time where you could just walk freely back there. And I don't know if it's still the same or not. Um, but, you know, you could. You could just walk the grounds. It was right next to the home. So you could just, I think, to the right, if you're staring right at it, you can just go into the backyard. Now, you know, there are many reports of, of animals being seen there. A dog, a cat, um, the little girl who got her throat crushed. And, of course, let's not forget uh, Violet. You know, she she took her own life, basically in the backyard. Now, granted, you can make the argument she didn't actually die until she got in the home, but there's there's an accounting of a, of a police officer that uh, was was responding to a report of a woman crying in the backyard. So naturally, and this is this is more recent. I want to say 70s, 80s time frame. It could be off, but at um, any rate, he goes in the backyard, sees a woman there and tries to console her and apparently um this this woman looked at him and she was in period clothing smiled and then disappeared well needless to say this really really freaked out that that police officer and why wouldn't it and i guess and he never spoke about it until his retirement um and i buy that because when i went to the backyard and if you've never been to san diego it's it's usually pretty sunny and it's gorgeous out so you know Walking in a backyard and enjoying the sun in the outdoors, that's just something we did as San Diegans. Yeah, um, so there was a tree there, and I was fairly young. You know, I'm older now, so getting dizzy from time to time, that just comes with it. You know, you start aging, right? Well, no. I was, you know, early teens, if not right before my teens, when we were going there quite often. And I got dizzy. When I say dizzy, I felt like the whole world went sideways. Um, it just, it just did not seem right. I remember getting like that panic attack feeling, um, like I wanted to lay down. Um, my jaw started shaking. It was just a, a very troubling, scary, scary experience. Um, I felt like everybody was watching me. I felt that there were people all around me, although I was completely by myself. Um, dad and grandma had gone into the house and they were doing the tour. Um, and I was out by myself. It was a different time folks, <laughs> but, but, um, you know, I just remember having that panic attack and I sensed so much dread in that backyard. And it's just, it's awful when you get that sense because there's no reason for it. You know, I was young, so it's not like I had any, any troubles of the world <laughs> weighing on my mind. I was extremely healthy. So uh, I have no idea what happened that day. I feel like maybe I, if you, if you prescribe to that sort of thing, that maybe I channeled some energy at that moment because I really felt despair. And if you remember correctly, I mentioned that on the grounds was the gallows. And I just, to this day, I think that maybe I was feeling something from someone who had perished there. Um, it's, it's tough to say. Um, but I certainly felt it. It had a very profound impact on me. It is one of the reasons that I'm interested in the paranormal because it came at such a young age and it, it was quite impactful. Moving on a little bit from the house or the backyard itself, um, roughly about, I think, three blocks or so from the from the home is an old town uh, cemetery. And it's a, obviously it's a very historic cemetery and it's the El Campo Santo Cemetery. Now, that is a place where a lot of early San Diegans were laid to rest. It is also the place where Yankee Jim is laid to rest. And there have been a lot of reports of paranormal activity there. Some say they've seen, you know, Thomas Whaley. Some say that they've seen the ghost of Anna. Some say they've seen, well, I mean, it runs a gamut of a lot of different people that could or could not be uh, haunting that, that cemetery. But you got to keep in mind, it is, it is a cemetery. Um, but its biggest report is Yankee Jim. Um, you know, he wrongfully or, or just, I should say, it was not the most humane way to leave this, this mortal coil. But, you know, yeah, he committed a crime, but it, I don't think that the punishment absolutely fit the crime at all. But anyway, you, when people take pictures, you see orbs, sometimes there's flashes of light. You know, when you, when you talk about orbs, especially in photography, 
you know, there's dust out there. It's a very dusty area. Could that have been the orbs? In my personal opinion, 9 out of 10 times, it's just dust. To me, an orb, you can't really mistake that. I've seen pictures where an orb literally illuminated something around it. That's a lot different than some of those, you know, arbitrary circles you can see in dust in some of these pictures over a lens. So... You know, that's that's another one of those where I, I don't put a ton of stock in a lot of these quote unquote orb photographs. I think when I first started getting into paranormal activity and, and same with with Nicole, we were big on those. And we realized at some point, you know, as you get as you get more involved in the paranormal research and in different things that happen, you know, you, you quickly discount those because you realize that for the most part, those are just dust. But um, look, hey, listen, uh, mine is a little bit of a shorter one than normal. You know, I. I don't have my partner in crime, so rather than just uh, make a, a one-hour episode of me just blathering on, I typically try to keep it shorter when it's just me. Um, but you know, I I think about San Diego a lot. Um, it was a it was a very very important time in my life. It was short. I wish it would have been longer. Um, but you know, I often think of it as being my formidable time, and it was something that that I cherish. My time in Old Town it was just amazing. You know, I don't know if Doodle Burgers is still there. I've heard rumors that it's moved to El Cajon. I don't know. If if you're a fan and, and you want, drop me a line and tell me if I'm right or wrong. Um, and I also heard that La Murguesa is gone too. And if it is, man, that's devastating because that place is, was good. Uh, I really hope it isn't because someday when I go back, I'd love to go. But it, obviously, if it's not there, I can't. But, you know, I think very fondly of, of the people that I went to high school with at Patrick County High School. Go Patriots. Um, you know. I miss everybody, and uh, if you could drop me a line and you remember me, I, I'd love to love to chat. So, anyway, I'll catch you guys later. Thank you so much for joining us. Our podcast is available just about everywhere you can put a podcast these days. If you'd like to support us, we do have an option for that on Spotify. Um, you know, we're looking to potentially do things like, um, well, personalized offerings for people who are supporters um whether that be video or live or you know certain things but you know something that we're kicking off um also uh you know drop us a line on facebook we do have the facebook community or the facebook group so love to hear from you guys um if not we'll uh, we'll see you next week